sources like if you are tracing is generating a lot of memory uh, trace data that has to be stored in the memory obviously you are going to compete for the memory channel uh, bandwidth and that's, that would affect the CPU performance so they come up with some of the techniques to you know, make sure that the trace gen data generator is very compressed and you can filter the amount of trace data that is generated and what are the use cases of CPU tracing? So typically it has been uh, debugging your software where uh, you can debug software without having to intervene the execution of the software and collect the information back and then you can analyze them later and figure out what was the work, what was the software doing wrong. And another interesting use case is the performance analysis and performance optimization. Uh, things like uh, you can uh, have a dynamic view of the program's behavior uh, how, how the program behaves, where does it jump, and that can be further used to provide feedback into the compiler or, or other tools to optimize where you place the code and thus improve the performance of your software. So what is ARM core site? It, it, core site is a term that is often confused between different terminologies. And uh, So the ARM core site is an architecture for uh, debug and trace on the ARM architecture CPUs and it covers all the profiles of CPUs that are compliant to the ARM architecture like the A class, R and M class. So it's a common architecture that defines physical interfaces, programming interfaces and, and, and the system architecture. So it defines things like how you find out what are the components in the system and how do you identify the different components uh, and uh, some, sometimes it also it defines the physical interfaces like the trace bus that carries the, bus, the trace information around the system and the bus that is used to access the programming interface of the components and sometimes it also defines the hardware, external hardware input ports like the JPEG port and how do you connect them into the tracing subsystem and the port side system to make external debugging as well as internal debugging. So you can connect it device over a JPEG port and then you know control the debugging and tracing aspects of the system. So that has been the predominant use case uh, but of late the SOCs have been you know becoming powerful and they can do some more you know power and they can do the tracing on their own and that's called the self-hosted mode where uh, the CPU itself is tracing its application that it's running on. And uh, so the, the components have a memory map interface as well as system register access for some of the components which you can use to program them. And it is often confused between the architecture and the IP source that are available for you know, consumption. So this is how a typical foresight tracing subsystem looks like. There are, in this picture there are three different classes of components. Uh, you can see there are the loop components which are the sources which generates the trace data. So you can see that uh, there are four CPUs in the picture and each of the CPU has an entity called ETM, which is the emitter trace macro cell. So that is more closely monitoring the CPU's execution and generates the trace data for the CPU. And there's something called system trace macro cell, which is SDM, which can be used by an application to generate the application trace into the trace bus, trace bus infrastructure and can be collected. Uh, the, the second class of components are the sinks where the trace data that is generated is captured so that you can extract them for later analysis. Those, those are depicted in the green color. So the first one is uh, in the uh, uh, sinks is the TPIU, it's a trace port, trace port interface unit which can carry the trace data generated on the system to an external component so you can connect a trace analyzer and you know, take the trace data out of the system. The second component is the ETBs, Emperor Trace Buffer. It has an internal buffer where it can store all the trace data and which can be later accessed using the device registers. And that, and that implies that it's quite slow because if you want to schedule a process, different process and have a different tracing session, you have to read back all the trace data word by word and that can be quite time, time consuming. One of the use cases for ETB is to retain the trace data over a system warm reset and things like a panic. When a panic occurs, you could still have the trace data captured in the ETB and which can be later collected using a Kerm kernel. So that's something that Leonardo is currently working on. Uh, and today our 
topic of interest would be the TMC ETR, it's an uh, embedded trace router which collects the traces and it can dump it into the system memory so that you can easily context switch and you can get a better performance with the trace collection. And the green components that you see in the picture, they are called links. So what they facilitate is, is they carry the trace data from the sources in, into the uh, re relevant uh, things. There are funnels which aggregate multiple streams of trace data and, and there are replicators which can you know, duplicate the data into multiple different things. There is there's something called ETF in, in between. You can see that it has a slight small uh, hardware buffer that can be used as buffering to make sure that you know the transmission is smooth when the data transfer rates are slightly different with source and sync. So this is what we discussed in the picture and I tried to expand all the acronyms that are there. I know that there are a lot of acronyms and I have tried to explain them here. So for the rest of the conversation we will be uh, concentrating on the ETM, the embedded trace microcell and the TMC ETR. The ATMs are uh, attached to a CPU and they monitor the execution of the CPU and then they generate trace information based on the uh, execution of the CPU. And it generates the information in such a compressed manner that you, you can have you know, very less information, a very, very, very less data produced for a long duration of the execution. So there are different tactics like metadata about the execution and, and things like program execution uh, context like what are the branches executed, what were the exceptions that occurred. And it doesn't generate uh, trace data for each and every in ex instruction executed, it just trade, generates the packets for you know, some of the uh, special instructions like branches, exceptions, and uh, synchronization events like ISBs. Uh, and uh, you can have additional uh, metadata information like cycle counts, which tells you how many cycles were elapsed between the previous packet and the next packet so you can get a better idea of how much cycle the CPU has spent executing them and it can also have some timestamps which can be used as a global reference for correlating multiple different streams. So here is an example of the packets that were generated. So you can see the first line is the context information saying that it's a 64-bit address and, and you have the, what is the address that I'm going to start with, what is the execution level of the program, it says that it's an application running in 64-bit mode. And you can see the first packet down below is the atom format, which says there was a branch which was executed. And it doesn't tell you what is the target address for the source address of the branch. So it's really compressed, it's one byte of data for a branch. So you need the program text to actually correlate what was that branch corresponding to. And you can see the cycle count information saying, oh, this is the cycle count, I'm going to start, start the cycle counting and you can go further down. And the last packet in the series is an ATA format 6 packet, and that is again a single byte information, but that can encode up to 24 branches that were taken. So it's, it's really compressed data that is produced, and you need the program text to make sense of what is going on. And like any other tracing subsystems, you, you can filter the amount of trace that, that is generated. There are address range comparators. You can say, okay, this is a start address and this is the end address. I want to start trace only in between this window. And you can also trace based on the process context ID, like the context IDR, or you can context or you can trace a particular VM based on the VM ID. Or and there are a lot of other different resources like counters and state, state machines that, that you can program. And often you can combine these resources to create complicated scenarios on how you want to trace them. Okay, moving on to the sync, uh, it's the embedded trace router that, that can route the trace over to the system RAM. And uh, it can use the memory, given memory in different modes. Uh, there are circular buffer mode and software fifth mode. In the circular buffer mode, what we do is we, the, the ETR starts writing from the top of the buffer and the moment it hits the end of the buffer, it overwraps and keeps overwriting the buffer. So you, don't, you have a potential chance of losing the data unless you collect the data before you know, it overlaps. Unfortunately, there is no buffer overflowing trip, so you don't know when that is happening and you, know, you have to deal with it. The software fee for mode, however, doesn't overwrite the data, it stops 
the trace pushing and it applies a back pressure to the guy who generated the trace saying that I can't push more data, so please consume it. So you have to consume the data before it can push further uh, information to the memory. But again, since you don't have an interrupt, you can't really use this because you don't know when the buffer is full. And as I mentioned, it's a, it's a memory buffer and you need to know where your, where your buffer trace starts. So there are read and write pointers which are nothing but the head and tail of your buffer. Um, and uh, you can use the memory in different modes like any other device which performs in DMA. You, you can use a flat buffer which is physically contiguous. So you would program the base address of, of the buffer and tell what, what is the size of this buffer. And there is another mode called scatter gather mode which can use physically discontinuous pages and you can create a page table that is understood by the ETR and program the base address to the page table and set the bit saying that I'm going to start using the scatter gather mode. So the ETR would fetch the pointers from the page table and then write into the trace memory. And you can chain multiple page tables using the link pointer at the end of the page. Now let's get back to the software story. And the course state support was added around 2014 time frame and it was first available since version 3.19. And it was mainly developed and maintained by Leonardo. Currently it's maintained by Matthew Poirier and uh, he's working with Leonardo. And as, as I initially showed in the picture, there are a lot of components in the tracing system and the kernel needs to know what are the components, how do they connect to each other. So the device tree has to specify the components and the base addresses where it is mapped and how they are connected. And you, you can also specify the clones and power domains for, for the components so that the driver can bring the component up before it can use it. So one of the aspects is that tracing is something that you may not use all the time. So you can turn off the power to the components and then turn it on when you only need it. And uh, when it was added, it was controlled via CSFS. So what you would do is you would say that, okay, I want to start tracing from this CPU, and I want to collect the trace in this particular sync, like the TMC ETR. And the driver will take care of enabling and finding the path between the source and the sync, and enable each of the components in the path along the way. And once you stop the session, you can actually collect this trace back from a miscellaneous device that we expose uh, in slash dev, so you can get the trace data back using that. As you can see, that it doesn't allow you to trace a single application because you there's no way to control the context switching of, of the CPU tracing, right? So, so we need perf interface. And that's where perf comes in. The perf support was added in uh, 2016, uh, and it was available since 4.6 version of the kernel. And the, uh, but uh, the perf tool support was still missing. It was still in living in an outside tree uh, of the GitHub, maybe because we didn't have an open library that can be you know used to integrate with perf so that you can decode the ETM packets that were generated. And now we have this library. It's called Open uh, Open Core Site Trace Decoder Library or Open CSD, and it's hosted in, again in GitHub, maintained by Leonardo. Uh, it's, a, it's a BSD3 license, so anybody can use it, and, uh, and the perf tool support was finally merged in 4.16. And it supports the generic format under something that is also used by the Intel PT PMU. Uh, and the ETR sync support was added very lately, and it's going to be in 4.20, that's something I worked on. And it uses the auxiliary trace infrastructure provided by the perf subsystem where you, the user can provide a set of pages where, which can be you know, filled in by the hardware and that can be again part of the sample generated in the perf. Currently, uh, it's only restricted to tracing a single threaded application and this is mainly due to the topology and some of the other issues that we are having with perf infrastructure. I'll come to that in the coming slides. And this is how you can use the perf Typically with the core site, uh, perf record, CS underscore ETM is the name of the PMU, and you have to explicitly specify the sync that you want to collect because, again, due to the topology, you, you don't have a single sync for a source, uh, like an ETM. 
So you have to specify the source, the sync, and you can give some of the options like cycle accounting. You want to say that okay, I want variable cycle accounting and time stamping, and there are a lot of different options. And if I put the standard option saying that I want I want to trace only the application side of the things like the user space, that's that's why you see the slash u there. And you need to use the per thread option right now because we are restricted to that, and that will make sure that the perf creates an event per thread of the application rather than per CPU. And once you are once you have collected the information, you can decode it using the perf report that, that dash d, and that gives you the trace information like this. So you can see that there are a lot of uh, metadata information in the beginning, like the synchronization trace information, and uh, so one. The, when the trace starts, you can see a trace form packet, uh, like index 67, and then it gives you what is the instruction that I'm supposed to start with, and it also it, then it starts executing, giving out the information about the packets that are executing. And you can see that there was an exception at index 81, and what was the address which, which caused the exception, and then since we have specified that I want to trace on user space, it stops tracing, and you don't see any more packets. And then you can see that the tra again there's a trace on which is at index 105 that says that I'm back to the user space, I'm going to start tracing again, and again I'm going to give you the address where I'm going to start tracing with so that you can decode it with the text. And then it leaves on, continues to give on the uh, packets. And you can see that the cycle count at the last line here shows that 101 hex cycles were spent during the sync execution. Now this may not be that really useful unless you can you know, decode it back with the program text and perf inject can just do that for you. It can go through the program text and then generate the synthesized instruction and it can show you where, where the gems happen like this. Okay, so what is next? We have for the work to do, like, as I mentioned, we can only support a single thread process right now. The issue is that we have to connect multiple events into one single source, I mean, one, one single output buffer. So that's something currently worked on, and uh, there are other ways to work around this problem. I mean, there are other ways to fix this problem by making changes to the topology that we'll come to again later. And uh, so, the, the, as I mentioned, the, uh, the EGM has multiple different resources that you can combine to control the tracing. Uh, currently, we don't have a simple infrastructure or, or any API to specify this via perf. So we have to. We are, we are exploring the usage of EBP of filters uh, to see if that can be useful. And obviously, the ACPI support is still pending, and, but but the work is under progress now. We are working with the ACPI forum to standardize the graph specification, which is which is what something we use in DTLAN to describe the connections. Now, these are the things that we can do in the software, and there are some things that we can't do with, without the hardware support. Those are the system challenges that we're having. Right now, we are using double buffering with ETR, which means that the ETR cannot use the buffer provided by the user, it uses a separate buffer. The moment you stop tracing, it copies over the data back into the user space buffer. It's not, you know, optimal. The, one of the reasons is that, there are two reasons actually. So one is, again, you don't have the buffer overflow interrupt, so you can't know when you're going to overwrite the buffer, which is being still being consumed by the buff. The second problem is that, so when you're tracing a process, when the process gets scheduled out, you have to stop the tracing, and when it gets back into the CPU, you have to start from where it left off. So you have to start somewhere in the middle of a buffer, which is not something that ETR supports. ETR can only say that, okay, I want to start, once you start, I'll start tracing from the beginning of the buffer, and I'll continue rewriting. So that's something that's not supported. So there is no way to save and restore the context of the ETR trace buffer, uh, in the hardware. And the next one is virtualization. You can't really use the core site inside a guest because the moment you give control to the guest, uh, the guest can actually profile the hypervisor because 
you know, unless you track and emulate every single access, which is not optimal again. So we need architect architectural changes to make sure that, you know, uh, a guest can safely use uh, the core site without much performance impact. Again, you cannot trace, you cannot have multiple process, multiple per process running, tracing different subsystems because of the uh, topology. We typically, as I showed in the picture, that that's the current state of the you know design that we have in systems where you have single ETR. Unless we have multiple ETRs, we, we can't really you know trace them. And power management has been a big problem in the past where the power domain management is you know handled by a secret processor inside your SOC and typically this is not exposed into an operating system because people are we are worried about the security impacts and stuff. So we need a standard, you know, uh, proposal to make sure that you know this is available for the OS to control it. So these are the hardware changes that are happening now. So the ETR is, is getting changes. Uh, it is now having a new mode called software FIFO2 mode, where it is similar to the software FIFO mode, but it will generate an interrupt at a pretty different watermark level that you have set. So when the buffer fills to a specified level, it can give an interrupt. So you know that can be used by the perf system to feedback that into the perf user space to collect the data and then move on. And uh, it it can also be used for you know offloading the trace to a, a functional I/O like the USB, where you know you can trace you can you can offload it to an external layer. But that's not something we can use with perf at the moment. And it also gets the support for list storing the buffer context where you can program the read and write program and write pointers and the ETR would start writing from the write pointer and it, it honors the values that you're programming there. Uh, one of the issues with that is you can no longer use the scatter gather mode because the scatter gather mode has all these data pointers inside the page tables and you can't really, the, the hardware cannot actually walk the page, the page tables to find out where that is. So the scatter gather mode has been ripped apart and uh, they, they recommend the IMMU to be used and there are other reasons for having an IMMU behind the ETR that will come to the inflator. Uh, and uh, the, so they have added a new scatter gather IP that is standalone component which can do a better job at the scatter gather mode. And there's something else happening in the ETM side of things. Uh, there's this ARM architecture version 8.4 extensions uh, mandate that they implement some of the features that support virtualization of the CPU tracing. So this include, you know, hypervisor or, or a, uh, EL3 level uh, firmware controlling what are the permitted regions that uh, uh, ATM can trace. So. Uh, I hypervisors can say that okay, you cannot trace uh, the hypervisor or EL2 level uh, in a particular register, saying that you know you are not you are prohibited from executing this. And uh, the the time source that I mentioned in the beginning uh, has been changed to the architecture time timer, and uh, you have provisions to you know control what is the time that the guest can see in the time sources. And we have some of the software hacks. So we had this old uh, ETR with scatter gather mode, and we tried this hack to, you know, rest save and restore the pointers in a session. So I'll quickly give, explain what that looks like. So the those are the, the first three tables that you see on the top. Those are the page tables, and the blue pages are other that actual data buffers. So Typically, you would set up these page tables uh, with each pointer pointing to the pages, and the very last point, pointer in the page table page would be a link to the next page. So those are annotated by a two-bit tag. So there are normal pages, a link page which has the link to the next table, and it keeps going on <coughs> to the next until you find a last page, which is marked in red in color. That's again a 
tag saying that this is the last page in the buffer. So the ETR will walk through the page tables, fetching each page tables, filling the pages, jump through the next page table, and when it finds the last page, it automatically jumps back to the beginning of the stage page table. So that is how the hardware works. Now, what we do is we add an extra dormant link at the end just after the red color pointer. So that's the second level one. And you, when you operate it normally, that's not visible to the ETR because the moment you see the red entry, it jumps back into the beginning. Now assume that you stop somewhere in between that you stop in between uh, the tracing, uh, the what you can see in this third picture, ETR DBA. So what you would do in this case is uh, you would change the tag of the <coughs> So assume that uh, you you started tracing and you stop here and now you want to start tracing from here what you would do is, you would not make any changes to the page table, but you would change the tag of this page pointer to the last one, and you would change the tag of the previous last page to normal. So those are two big changes, and you can program the ETR to the base of this point pointer, and the ETR can start fetching the pages from here, and keeps on going, and it finds the link, jumps back to the beginning and comes back all the way to here. So this works because the ETR doesn't check the alignment of the programmer that is point programmed into the DBA. So, so that's something that we are using now. And there are some issues that we cannot solve by hardware enhancements or the software enhancements. And uh, have you heard of SBSA in the ARM world. So it's a server-based system architecture that ARM came up with uh, to make sure that you know a system is compliant for the ARM server world. So the, the if if the system is, sub, is to be supported out of the box by software, you know, uh, distribution, it needs to comply to some of these standards that are set by the standards specification. So ARM has come up with something similar for Foresight to make sure that you have the out of box you know, experience in tracing. So what it does is, you know, it makes sure that the power management is available for the software OS to control and, and it has to be enabled and accessible by its OS. And it, it defines certain levels of standards for the trace sources and trace things so that you, know, you, can get, have, you can have a minimal guarantee of things there. So the level zero for uh, the ETM you know, maintains some of the you know, compatibility with the legacy systems where uh, you, you don't have to really support virtualization, but you need to have a global system counter uh, to make sure that you have a same system to analyze the data, but you are still limited with what you can do with virtualization. And the trace level one, it mandates that you need to have the 8.4 trace extensions, which means you get virtualization support by default, and uh, uh, you can use them uh, you know, with uh, the CAS. And the trace capture levels, that uh, they, they define the standard for the things, uh, and, and it supports the legacy, more, the level zero supports the legacy systems where you have ETBs and ATRs, and uh, you need not have multiple ETS on the system. Uh, but when you move on to level one, we mandate that each source or each ETM should be associated with independent trace things like an ATR or, or a ETB so that you can have independent trace sessions uh, without worrying about you know uh, multiple traces coming into the same uh, trace sync. So, one of the problems that we are facing with the independent trace that's now solved with this. And uh, taking another step level 
level two, the ETR uh, mandates that you need to have a IOMMU behind the ETR so that you know uh, the ETR can be used in virtualization without much overhead. Like the, SM, uh, the IOMMU can provide your stage one and stage two translations, and it just works out of the box. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, to conclude, uh, the dynamic tracing and performance analysis, those are not something, you know, electronic anymore. It can be done on a uh, mobile phone and, 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 and this hardware is so powerful that, you know, you can really do this. And the port side story is evolving, uh, driven by the requirements for the self fostered tracing and you can see that there are hardware changes that there are and software changes that we have and some of the system design guidelines that have been improved to make sure that you get out of the box tracing capability. And uh, that's all I have. Any questions? Yeah, so for the question I'll bring the microphone. Thanks for the talk. Uh, so I need, um, uh, what's the connection to D3 ES5? Do you plan to use that as, as a UI also? Sorry? The uh, D3 ES5 mm -hmm. uh, on towards in the end. Uh, do you plan to use this as UI or controlling interface? Uh, no, uh, so this is all about the perf usage. The D3 and D3 I and mean, DS5, they, they still work. Uh, you know, they're out there and they can still work. Uh, but you know they don't you know they're completely automatic they, they don't interact with the T stream or DS5 uh, as such. I mean they, they still work. Okay, so no plan to provide this as a backend for DS5 for example. Uh, no, this is this is to make sure that you know you can use it uh, within the system uh, and uh, there are changes obviously there are changes in the architecture for DS5 that are not covered here, but. Yeah, this is mainly on the uh, self posted tracing uh, aspect where you trace within yourself in the software stack. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Sorry, just just to add on to that, um, one of the things I mentioned about the new mode in the ETR, uh, which can uh, offload the trace data over a functional I/O, uh, there is a prototype for that to offload it to a, you know a external entity like a DS5. Uh, via USB gadget, but you know, yeah, that's there. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, ACPI mm -hmm. and tools. Um, any, any, what's the status or uh, like? So um, it's a, it's an interesting story. So uh, one of the requirements for us to use the core site with ACPI is to get the topology information. Uh, we can't rely on we can't rely on the hardware uh, provided topology information, so we need this provided by the firmware via GT or ACPI, and that is specified by a graph binding which you know, suits the need of the problem. And ACPI graph specifications were not formal. There is one implementation of that available in the Linux kernel right now, uh, but that is not something. Uh, as standard specified by the ACPI. So uh, the architecture team from ARM is working with the ACPI forum to you know, formalize the graph specifications and uh, it should be available with ACPI 6.3 version if I'm not wrong. So once, that, once we have that available, we'll be adding the support for that. We have some prototypes based on the initial proposals that we have, but you know, we can't uh, uh, public size it until the specification is out. Thank you. Yeah.